Hello everyone. Welcome to this very, very early stream. I'm sorry if you can hear the bells. Um, I live in between two churches and it's like every Sunday they sort of try and compete for who can be the loudest with their bells. So I apologize if you can hear that. I also apologize yesterday for not being able to stream. I if for those of you who don't know, I'm still in recovery from a herniated disc, um, and I've been doing really well. I've been feeling really great, and yesterday I felt the best that I felt in, I can't even tell you when, weeks. I, I had no pain when I woke up, you know, the, the early morning pain. I had none of it. I was like, yes, I, I cleaned my whole house, and, and I ran errands, and I took my dog on a really long walk, and I was like living my best life and then it just my back just totally punished the hell out of me for it my back was completely unhappy with me and I was basically useless from like 5 p.m onwards so that was 100% my fault a uh, final thing I want to apologize for this is, just a, this is Huddy's apology tour welcome um, final thing I want to apologize for is um, I <laughs> I've been getting people telling me that like my um, live streams are like monetized and uh, I do monetize uh, a lot of my videos like my lore videos and things I don't typically monetize my live stream videos or my blood on the grand strand uh, TTRPG my actual play I don't like um, monetize those videos but in case anyone isn't aware uh, YouTube recently released a new policy I think last month where they're going to monetize videos even if you don't and if you don't monetize them and they have the option to decide to monetize monetize them and they'll take the money instead of giving it to you or splitting it with you rather how it works so if there is monetized stuff on my live streams or on blood on the grand strand that's youtube doing it not me because i typically don't do that because there's nothing worse than having like a, a live stream with like because it's so long with having like a hundred little advertisements in it so that's not typically what I do. I don't make a lot of money from my YouTube channel. That's not a thing. And I don't try to make a lot of money from my YouTube channel. Um, I make my YouTube channel because I want to, because I enjoy it. So <laughs> uh, I'm not looking to make a quick buck off of it or anything. <clears throat> uh, 
But anyway, yes, welcome. Um, I don't expect a lot of you to be able to be here with me because, again, it's really early and tonight I'm busy, so um, I'm doing stuff with friends tonight, so... I just thought I'd get this out of the way. I also just want to say, in case Fairy Blood doesn't get a chance to join the stream because it's so early, happy birthday. I hope you have an awesome day. So in the last time that we played this, um, we started fixing up our grandfather's store. We met our other childhood friend, Adam, who is now in a wheelchair from accidentally shooting himself. And uh, we are currently at the party that the mayor invited us all to. Um, well, I, I think it's like he invites the, the muckety mucks, the, um, like upper echelon of society in the town. And then he, like he raffles off seats at his dinner table or something. I don't know. It's very strange, but for whatever reason, he gave us a ticket or an invitation, however you want to put it. So we um, met with a teacher whose name escapes me at the moment, um, who won a raffle to be there. Um, we also went and talked to the sheriff, um, who we used to work for when we were a teenager, and we started telling a story to him about the only time we ever were at Bleak Rest House, which is this very large mansion in the town, whoops, which is apparently a, a site of a serial killer once upon a time in the 70s. And uh, we started telling him the story of when we tried to go in there as we were kids, when it was abandoned, and um, we started having a panic attack. So I ended just after we had the panic attack, and the um, sheriff suggested that we go talk to this woman named Dr. Lobo, who's a doctor, <coughs> Dr. Martina Lobo. Um, but I don't actually want to talk to her. Um, I kind of... Hmm. Well, we had the option before. Yes, right there. Uh, so right after we had the panic attack, um, we had the option to talk to Miss Clark. Now, Miss Clark is apparently the mother, Kendra Clark. She's the mother of Michaela Clark, who came into our store just before we left for the party and basically told us that this town is holding or harboring a dark secret and we need to uh, not trust anyone and we can only trust her. And she had garlic on the back of her bike. So obviously she uh, has a suspicion that there are vampires in the town. It, it's likely she doesn't understand the world of darkness vampires. She just believes that they're vampires and it's just going off of any old uh, mythology that she can find. But of course there are some vampires in the world of darkness who can't cross water and um, are afraid of garlic and things like that. It just depends. So I love about the world of darkness. It's so cool. But anyway, let's continue. Let's go talk to Mrs. Clark by the hors d'oeuvres. God, those bells are so loud. You walk over to Kendra Clark by one of the long tables packed with finger foods and dainty morsels. She picks among the items with wide eyes and a gleeful smile like she's choosing flowers from a garden. Quite a spread, you say, stepping next to her. She regards you for a second and selects a dollop of brightly colored spread on a cracker. Let me just uh, check something before I continue. Yeah, I think everything's working fine. <clears throat> I love these parties. I'm so sick of eating vegan mac and cheese or tater tots. When did fish eggs become vegan, you say, pointing to the caviar? She scoffs. I'm not vegan. My daughter thinks she's one. She gets into these fads, though this one has stuck for quite a while. She eats vegan, so mostly I eat vegan too. It's easier than making two dinners every night. So when I come to events like this, I try to make up for everything I've missed. But enough about my family's eating habits. I don't think we've met. I'm Kendra Clark. I write for the Herald and the Tribune Review. I'm Huddy Campbell, I say, and shake her hand. Um... Oh, we could ask her what type of article she writes, do a Wits Insight. What's our Wits Insight? Three Wits, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, two Insight, that's a pretty good roll, so let's do that. Let's ask her. Hopefully we won't lose another wall power. Kendra pops a steamed dumpling in her mouth. She chews her food, making you wait for the answer. I mostly cover local and county news, crime, some community matters. Crime? I doubt there's much to report. The case of the double-parked bread truck doesn't sound like front-page front news. You'd be surprised. We have our share of theft, assault, meth labs, breaking and entering. There was that whole Annis Keene ordeal. 
We've even had a few missing persons. The moment she says it, she sucks in a breath. You get the sense she regrets the last statement. Missing persons? I'm definitely intrigued now. Kendra waves her hand like she's shooing a fly. Every community has missing persons. It's not that big of a story. You detect more hesitation in her voice, more deflection. There's more to the story than she's letting on, and your curiosity won't, <clears throat> won't let this rest. If it's not a big story, why did you mention it? She rolls her eyes and adds sushi to her plate. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. I don't think I am. You move around the table to confront her face to face. You've got me hooked. Can't you tell me anything? She sighs and looks at her plate of food. She pus pushes around the tiny morsels with a toothpick. Look up the name Monroe Duncan. That's all I'll say about it. She finishes filling her plate and grabs a pile of napkins. It was a pleasure to meet you, honey. I'm sure we'll be seeing each other around. Nice to meet you, too. She walks away and waves to an older man just entering the Grand Hall. You check out your watch and see the cocktail hour is half over. There's still time to kill, so you check out. Um, another person I wanted to see was Marcus, who um, we saw his picture. A little very smiley young man. I think he works for the Sheriff's Department. You make your way to the wooden bar and slide into a stool next to Marcus. He holds a glass and rattles the ice cubes inside. His tailored shirt looks too small and tight for his muscular frame, and his naturally black hair looks dark brown in the dim light of the bar area. With his sleeves rolled up, you see a number of black and gray tattoos peeking out. He turns his head in your direction and offers a courteous smile. I can't wait for dinner to start, he says. I'm not big on appetizers unless it's wings or chicken fingers. Marv only serves rich people apps like avocado rinds and pumpkin seeds. I knew I should have hit up Carter's before this. I haven't been to Carter's in years. Their potato salad was amazing. A bartender steps over to him. Another cranberry juice, sir? Shaken, not stirred. The bartender points to you. Can I get you anything? You order, and the bartender prepares both drinks and places them in front of the two of you. Marcus turns and looks at you like he's trying to figure you out. You look familiar. Do we know each other? We haven't met, but everyone in town seems to know my grandfather, Lucas Campbell. He squints his eyes and stares up in thought. I've heard the name, but I don't know him. You here visiting him? Um, he passed away and left me his store, Campbell Services. I'm thinking of moving back to town to run it. Fuck, I'm sorry, he says. You should have totally moved to town. We need cool people in the Heights. I'm cool? He nods with confidence. I can tell these things. Wait, did you like your grandfather? Did I like my grandfather? Yeah, my grandfather was a dick. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist one. We don't get to choose who we're born to. So did you and your grandfather get along? Um... We didn't always see eye to eye. Toward the end, we didn't even talk. Marcus chuckles to himself. I wish my grandfather didn't talk to me. Maybe we should have gotten along. Anyway, I wish I had met your grandfather. He smirks and pushes his front curl to the side. If it weren't creepy, I'd offer you a hug. <laughs> I would say... I hug complete strangers all the time. It's a hobby of mine. Marcus cracks a smile. That's funny. I'm sorry. No problem. You may not want to offer a hug to just everyone you meet. I know that. Marcus raises his voice but catches himself. He returns to a softer volume. Sometimes my mouth blurts out things before my brain finishes working it out. Marcus stares at his watch. We need to eat soon or I'm calling in for sandwiches. I'm going to head in the kitchen and see if I can sneak a drumstick. Good talking to you. See you later. The classical music in the Grand Hall switches to soft jazz, and dinner party guests start making their way into the dining room to find their seats. The chatter of conversation thins out, though enough people remain at the bar for one last cocktail. Mayor Bumpley hurries through the Grand Hall and past his guests and stops at the glass door to the garden. He knocks to gain the attention of Sheriff Ray, who's been outside since the cocktail hour began. The sheriff nods and enters the house and joins the mayor. 
and the two move through the double doors of the library, which close behind them. You head over to... Oh, we could eavesdrop on people. I was going to go to look at Bleak Rest House. Let's, I don't think I have any clandestine. Let's check. Dexterity. No, that's not a good roll. Dexterity and clandestine. That's terrible. <laughs> I guess we're not going to eavesdrop. Um, let's just go to the rooftop deck to see Bleak Rest House just before cocktail hour is over. You climb the grand staircase to the second floor and search along the upper level until you find the door leading up to the roof. Half expecting it to be locked, you're pleasantly surprised to find it open, and you take the narrow staircase to the top. It ends in a rectangular swing door, which you push open and climb out to a furnished deck. Wicker sofas and chairs are set around a tiled area, and off to one end stands a wooden bar, covered in blue canvas. A fire pit sits in the middle of the deck, though it's unlit and cold. Though the whole place looks like an amazing spot for a gathering, you're alone up here. You look out across Jericho Heights in the still night, a few birds flying against the black backdrop of the starless sky. A breeze blows across the rooftop, and with it comes the aroma of the food cooking in the kitchen below. Underlying it comes the scent of something far less savory, something earthen and old. You were only six years old when your grandmother died, but you still vividly remember the smell of the cemetery. She was buried at Serenity Park, and to this day, whenever you catch that smell from the graves, you grow cold and have a sense of unease. Even now, you feel the need to look over your shoulder every once in a while as if you're being watched. <clears throat> and then you see it, Bleak Rest House. It stands not so far away, but it seems small and not so imposing as it once did when you were a teenager. Maybe all the stories of your youth piled one on top of the other until you could no longer see the house for what it was, a crumbling old mansion. As an adult, you know it's only made of wood and stone and brick. The horrors you once imagined are decades in the past. As you walk closer to the edge of the deck, you see a figure standing on a balcony of Bleak Rest House. Could this be the owner? What did Michaela call her? Amanda Chastain. The figure turns to you as if she knows you're watching her. A sudden feeling creeps over you, something unsettling. You thought you were alone, but with her looking in your direction, it no longer feels that way. You fan yourself to cool down, though the hairs on your arms stand straight up. You swallow hard to clear a dry mouth, and you wipe your forehead with the back of your hand. When you look back at the figure... She stands pressed against the stone railing and gives you a slight wave. You freeze in place. Your body feels like a statue and your chest is tight. No air flows into your lungs. All you can do is stare straight ahead through the darkness at the figure on the balcony. Your mouth opens, but no words come out. And who would you be speaking to? She stands so far away, it's not like she can hear you. And yet you try to talk to her. Why? It's her eyes. Two slivers of red pulsing like a beating heart. You close your eyes and stumble away, tripping on your own feet. Turning, you break into a sprint, right leg smashing into a wicker chair. Rounding it, you take off to the trap door on the roof and race down the stairs, skipping steps as you go. Once back on the second floor, you stop and press your back against the wall. Moments pass as you take in deep breaths. You're safe again. <clears throat> but were you ever in danger? Was your mind playing tricks on you? I lost another point of willpower. Oh my God. What do I have one left? I need to go to bed and regain some willpower. Um, resolve. What is it? For game willpower, resolve and composure. For. <clears throat> I need to go to bed. I like to leave this party. A bell rings at the front of the grand hall. Mayor Bumpley stands before double doors with arms raised like a conductor. Everyone, attention. Dinner is now served. Please leave your drinks here and follow me inside. The chefs have done an absolutely perfect job tonight. You will not believe your eyes or taste buds. Food, like love, brings out the best and the worst in people. Free food of the quality present in Bumpley's Manor in Bumpley Manor's dining room can be likened only to a drug for the way people push and maneuver around one another to be first to indulge. 
Though everyone in attendance will be served that night, no one can seem to wait for Cornish hens and pheasant. Pork belly and bacon jam. Ugh, bacon jam sounds delicious. I have never had it, but the, I don't even, I've never even heard of it, but it sounds delicious. Mangitout peas and roasted asparagus, black truffles, fresh baked pumpernickel bread, and other delectables. Fine china, crystal goblets, and glasses, and polished silverware set each place around a long table that could appear in some Victorian palace. As you start your search for a place to sit, you notice Salem and Adam have finally arrived. She is dressed in a black knit dress with a black lace shawl over her shoulders, and her hair is up in a crown of braids. She stands in front of the place setting already near the middle of the table. Adam wears a dark blue suit with a light blue tie and looks to be overdressed for the occasion, though you imagine this is what he wore to work. He can't move five feet without shaking a hand or greeting someone who positively lights up at his very presence. You're amazed at how quickly the table fills. Um, I think we'll sit next to... I don't want to sit next... Lacey's the, the teacher. I don't want to sit next to Lacey. I didn't really like her. So let's sit next to Salem since last time we talked to Adam. Plus, he seems to be busy with everyone loving him so much. As you move to take a seat next to Salem, you notice both are already filled and so are the seats directly across from her. She went straight into the dining room when she arrived at the party while you came in for dinner closer to the end of the line of guests. You'll have to find another seat. Okay, so if we had gone to the dining room instead of going up to see Bleak Rest House, then we probably would have been able to sit next to her. So let's sit next to Adam then. As Adam rolls into a spot toward the front of the table, you take the seat to the right of him. He lights up a smile and wraps his knuckles on the table next to your plate. Hey there, thanks for inviting me. Sorry I'm late. My father had me working on a new client setup. It took way longer than I expected to go through a year's worth of receipts. She's been doing her own taxes for years, and I get the impression she's only showing me a small fraction of her wealth. I'm just glad I made it before dinner started. Ooh... Ooh. Yeah, I'm going to say late for our first date. Don't worry. I forgive you. <laughs> I can't help it. I love it. Adam's eyes go wide and he blushes. Well, that's good to hear. Don't worry. I won't be late for our second date. Before you can answer, Mayor Bumpley enters the room. Attention, everyone. Dinner is now served. Our first course is a tasting plate of soups, an elegant vegan spring pea soup, a coconut prawn soup, I'd have to skip that one because I'm allergic to coconut, and a chilled gazpacho. The pasta course will be roasted beef, whoa, kas, kasun, oh, I can't, I don't know what that word is, kasunzai, uh, with browned butter and poppy seeds. Finally, the pheasant will be out as our third course. I know you're all waiting for it. Please save your applause for the end of the night. Wow, three soups? This guy is a high roller, Salem says. Two columns of white gloved servers parade out of the kitchen with wooden trays of soup bowls in each hand and deliver them in front of each guest. The mayor raises his hands at the head of the table. I suggest you start from left to right with the pea soup first and progressing to... Shouting from the grand hall interrupts the rest of the speech. The door swings wide and in walks a young woman in a sheriff's uniform. This is a private party, officer. You can't go in there, a butler says and tries to block her path. <gasps> it's Deputy Maya. I'm so excited. She walks around him but stops to hold up her hand. I am not an officer. I am Deputy Sheriff Maya and I need to speak to Sheriff Raymond right now. The sheriff hangs his head like he's trying to hide from her, but the deputy spots him and heads straight over. She holds another clipboard and slams it on the table next to Sheriff Ray, rattling the glassware and soup bowls. April, this better be damn good with you interrupting us. He drops his spoon in the prawn soup, which, which splashes broth onto the tablecloth. Sir, we have a credible report of a missing person. He's 17 years old and hasn't been seen in six hours. And sir, I found something. She shows him the, cl the clipboard. Since you're sitting close to the sheriff, you happen to overhear their whispered conversation. It's Tyler Sanders, Deputy Maya says with an intensity to her voice, but wearing no emotion on her face. Abe's grandson? He stands and tosses his cloth napkin on the table. The deputy simply nods and clutches the clipboard to her chest. 
The mayor marches over, frazzled and angry. What is the meaning of all this? I am trying to... Th oh, no, that's the mayor. <laughs> ah! What is the meaning of all this? I am trying to throw a party. Sorry, Marv, gotta go. Thanks for the soup. All a bit too salty for my taste. Sheriff Ray steps away from the table and walks to the Grand Hall with Deputy Maya close behind. So that's, that's a, a lot of people missing. So if this Amanda Chast... Well, I assume Amanda Chastain's a vampire. She's not very good at keeping the masquerade. Which is kind of hard in a smaller town, to be honest. It's kind of weird for a vampire to be in a smaller town. Dinner ends shortly after the interruption. The mayor's staff scramble to provide platters for people to take home, but after the news spreads of the missing teenager, many guests lose their appetite. You're one of the last to leave, and on your way out, you find an iPhone in the driveway. Its gold and crimson case tells you Lacey lost it again. You'll make a point to return it to her tomorrow. You share a ride home with Salem in her father's car. She actually tutored Tyler for a while for a drawing class. She says he was smart and funny and creative. You arrive home just after 9 o'clock. On your way inside, something feels wrong. You hear faint, wet footsteps. Someone else is inside. You waste no time and rush upstairs, following the faint tracks. The large footprints grow lighter as you track them across the second floor and into your bedroom. You push the door open as slowly as possible and feel a stiff breeze flowing through the room. Your heart skips a beat before you walk inside. No one's there. A window is wide open, and one of the heavy curtains rustles in the wind. A dresser drawer sits slightly open, and one of your suitcases, not yet unpacked, has been moved a few inches to the right. Otherwise, the room is as you left it. Someone has been here. Great. At this point, you may use your unspent experience points to stay there for later. Yes, I want to use my unspent experience points, please. Um, yes. Okay, so attributes. I would like to increase my dexterity. I have 18. Oh, it costs 10 to raise it. That is, it costs so much. That costs so much. Hang on. That costs, I, I want some more money. Costs six to raise it. Okay, okay, okay. So, I'm going to raise our resources. And I want some more dexterity. Uh, or no, I want some more stamina, rather, is what I meant. Okay. And that leaves us with two, so I highly doubt we can get anything with two. <laughs> no. All right, it costs three to raise these things, so that's fine. That's fine. All right. Good. Save my remaining points to spend on later advance them. advancement. Okay. I got two stamina, so that should increase our health a little bit. Is my willpower recovered? Please, God, say it's recovered. I need to do... <laughs> I need to get some combat and athletics and stuff. Um... I only have one willpower at the moment. I'd like some more please. I accept the new ranks. I'm good. The story continues. Chapter four, nature and demeanor. Ooh, I have, I got to admit something. I'm a huge fan or I was, I don't, I haven't read an Anne Rice book in ages, but there was a time where I read, I think, almost all of the Anne Rice books. I know she started writing Vampire Chronicles again, something about Lestat, um, but I haven't read it. And I read her like Witches, Mayfield, Mayfair, Witches um, Chronicles. I used to be really into Anne Rice, but as I got older, I, I became less appreciative of her work because I felt like she was just, sometimes her books were just um, overly packed with fluff, like just a lot of... Um, unnecessary description just that just dragged the story on made you sort of forget what was going on <laughs> but that's just a me thing do you know what it means to be loved by death do you know what it means to have death know your name Anne rice interview with the vampire shrugging off the implications of someone breaking into your home you will you will yourself asleep thankfully you have a restful night with all of the work to do around the house and the store, it's clear that you need your energy. 
In the morning, you wake up feeling restored and ready to face the day's challenge. Willpower restored. Thank God. Now that you're up, you dig through your unpacked boxes you brought from Chicago. Inside one labeled home security, you find a number of wireless video cameras and security devices. You wire the house and store with a door and window sensors that send a text notification if breached. You set up motion detectors in numerous rooms and additional cameras with 24-hour recording along the perimeter of the entire property. If someone breaks into your home again, this will catch them. The report of the missing teenager last night at dinner has left you unsettled. Jericho Heights is a relatively small town, and you can't imagine how a teen can go missing, let alone a member of the high school's varsity wrestling team. Sure, there's still the disappearance of Monroe Duncan, but that was years ago. You can't help but wonder what's being done to find him. Is the sheriff's office working alone, or will they engage state or even federal help? Heck slept by your feet the whole night, and when you rise, she hops off the bed and follows you downstairs. I love her. After you feed her, she slinks off to another part of the house, most likely to sun herself. Heading downstairs, you find a note slipped under your front door. To the new store owner, my name is Q Lam Fan, and I am inquiring about continuing my position as retail clerk at Campbell Services. Mr. Lucas Campbell hired me six days prior to his untimely passing. Though my time in your establishment was short, I learned the product catalog, store layout, and ordering system. I will accept the same pay rate of $8 per hour plus commissions and can start any time. You may text me through www.freetexter slash numbers to let me know your answer. Yours truly, Lamb. <laughs> that is very strange. I, I kind of want to hire Michaela as opposed to Lamb. After a short breakfast, you head into the shop. At seven, you see a line of... Because, I'm sorry, Grandpa didn't have the best discretion. At seven, you see a line of people already waiting for the grand opening. Ooh, you scramble to make final arrangements before opening the store, adjusting products on shelves, making change available in the cash register, getting a book of receipts ready, and sweeping the floor and dusting off the shelves. Finally, at 7.30, you open the doors. That is so early for a bookstore. Campbell Services is open for business. I'd open at nine. Well, I guess... Did we have a cafe in there? If we have a cafe in there, then 7.30 is kind of late. I'd probably open at 6. <laughs> like I'm an entrepreneur or something. Oh, da. Yeah. Hello. You find the first two hours of your grand opening nothing short of chaos. You make several sales within the first few minutes of opening as people are excited that your grandfather's store is back in business. Unfortunately, you have barely enough product to meet the demand and people wander out of the store without making a purchase. It's a flurry of activity and you are excited to see your marketing efforts pay off. By 10 o'clock, the store is empty of the initial rush and you have your first break. On their way out, a few people mention how remarkable the store looks. They point out improvements and repairs you made and you're sure it will have a positive effect on your store's image. When you finally have a moment to breathe, you check your sales subtotal, $650. Since you don't have a credit card reader yet, your sales are all in cash. A short while later, the store's front bell rings and in walks a UPS delivery person with a box. After you sign for the delivery, you recognize the label as the supplier for the order you placed yesterday. You bring the box to the storeroom and set it aside as back stock. You hear an alert on your phone indicating a bank deposit. While living in Chicago, you joined an investment club and contributed money over the years to build shares of rental property. Yes. God, more money, please. Each, each month, they deposit your earnings in your bank account. You check your balance, and sure enough, it totals $4,003. <laughs> While you're checking your bank account, the front door opens once again. In walks a tall man, well over six feet, though he has a rounded back like he's constantly ducking not to hit his head. He has dark hair, but as he walks under a light, it seems to vanish, revealing its thinness. Something about him tells you he's much older than most people would assume. <clears throat> Good morning, he says in a refined accent you can't quite place. Maybe New England? Oh, okay. <laughs> How wonderful it is that the store is open again. I worried it would just rot away. But here it is again, alive and vibrant with fresh blood at the helm. 
He smiles with his lips tightly closed, sucking in his teeth. I could try to do like a Kennedy accent, but I'm not very good at that. New England clam chowder. Oh, God. Allergies. I'm trying not to sneeze. I'm sorry. I have the window open because it's ferociously hot. It's actually not super hot. So I actually have the window open to get cool breeze in, but my allergies have been terrible this summer. So all that tree pollen and, and because of obviously because of the plague, they haven't been doing um, like normal um, maintenance uh, around the trees and the, the, the visas, the grasses and stuff. I think, I think that's German. <laughs> the plots of land where there's grass and stuff. So like there's just been a lot of extra pollen hanging around. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing I'm going to think he's just a customer. As someone who worked in retail, this is what I would say. Thank you for coming in. Is there something I can help you with? The man looks around the store, craning his neck without moving his body, sort of like an owl. You can definitely help me, but we can get to that later. First, there is the little matter of introductions. I am Gabriel Jayfield, and I know you, Ahadi, granddaughter of Lucas. He bows to you. A brief flash of bright white fills your field of vision. A slow-moving image builds in your mind of a younger Gabriel walking through a cemetery. He comes to an open, fresh plot with a coffin next to it and its gravestone. Harriet Jayfield, 1901-1972. to Oh, it's because we have like some sort of connection with the supernatural that we get from our grandfather, some sort of um, sensitivity. The image lasts a split second and blinks away. So you knew my grandfather, you ask? I knew him quite well. We were business associates. He never mentioned me. He places both hands on the store counter and you notice clean manicured fingernails with rounded edges, but pointy in the middle. He notices your stare and curls your fingers. Um, sorry, your name has never come up, but I hadn't spoken to my grandfather in several years. Ooh, ooh, a minus three. I think he's a ghoul. I'm guessing ghoul. How sad for you. He was a great man and spoke highly of you often, Gabriel says. <coughs> When family becomes estranged, it can be the sharpest of cuts to our fragile souls. I experienced this with my own father. We rarely spoke as adults, and when he went away to the war and was killed, sadly. I often think of things I would say to him if he were still alive. Went away to the war. Sorry, I'm trying to think. Is he talking about himself? In 1901, this is before World War One, so. Yeah, the past few days, there's a lot of things I wish I could have said to my grandfather. I'm not surprised he died so suddenly, so suddenly that you haven't even fully grasped it yet. It's as if any moment he could walk in again. He turns and looks at the door, and for a moment... You almost expect your grandfather to walk in. So I've heard you live at Bleak, bleh, bleh, bleh. So I've heard you live at Bleakrest House, you ask. Is that true? I'm getting a notification. Oh, hello everyone who's been here in the chat and I haven't and my thing isn't Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I see people in the chat now. My thingy's not updating. Hang on one second. So sorry I've been ignoring you. I haven't meant to. <laughs> so sorry, everybody. <laughs> I think my, my, uh, my stupid phone wasn't updating. I'm feeling much better, everyone. Thank you for your kind words. I wish I could stream this later today, but I am meeting with, with friends later tonight, so I won't be able to. Um, 
His eyes widen as if he's proud of the recognition. Why, yes, my business partner and I purchased Bleak Rest House, as the townspeople call it, over five years ago. A terrible tragedy that happened at that home. But when you think about it, what is a home? Is it the history of the place? Is it the people who live there? Whether those people benefited society or stole from it? Is it the deeds of a deranged man who did unspeakable things there? No, I think it is none of these things. It is the walls, the ceilings, the floors, and all the things inside. It is a structure in which we live, and we should set aside any mythology surrounding a home. To name it after a known killer serves no one, unless you are in the business of scaring children with stories of boogeymen. Gabriel drags his hands across the counter, scraping his fingernails with a short squeal. My God, I would tell this guy to like get the hell out of my <laughs> store. I'd be like, no, please, no more. Okay. I can try and flatter him, but I don't know. I don't know what my persuasion is. Not good, I don't think. I got three manipulation and two persuasion. That's pretty good. So, I never thought of it like that. You have a unique perspective, I say, hoping to flatter him. Ooh, relationship plus 14. Dang, dang, I'm flattering. Thank you, Gabriel says. I like to think I do too. I never understood why this town likes to hold on to the pains of yesterday. Maybe this is something I should bring up on the next episode of my podcast. <laughs> should we strike the name of Bleak Rest House? I'll bring it up to my partner. As he stares off in thought, he taps his abnormally long finger to his lips. Gabriel pulls away from the counter and walks in a short circle around the store. He leans over to stare at the cover of a book and returns to the counter. Not much on the shelves as of yet. You frown. I'm working on it. I'm just getting started in here, but expect to have everything set up soon. Well, I should be going. You clearly have a lot of work to do, so I will leave you to it. Gabriel taps his hands on the counter. Before I go, I would like to ask for you to sell me something. When your grandfather ran the store, there was a rare first edition book he set aside for me that I never purchased. The Stranger by Albert Camus. I would like to buy it now. You pull up the store's record on your laptop, and sure enough, you see a note about an order for Gabriel. Yup, looks like my grandfather set that aside for you. I have it here if you'd like it today. Yes, I would like that. He draws a leather wallet from his pants pocket and counts out $600 bills in crisp bills. Okay. I hope you don't mind Benjamin Franklin's. Please send the item to my home. You certainly have the address. For the first time, you see Gabriel throw back his head and laugh. No problem, you say, and write up a receipt for him. Thank you for your purchase. He waves his hand dismissively. I am the one to thank you. Good luck with your grand opening. I will certainly return as a customer. Good day to you. Have a good day, you say, and watch him leave your store, his long legs striding down the street until he disappears from view. Friendly advice, having a total of four or five dots, meaning you can do well in a roll. Yes, I know. I'm, I'm sort of basing the idea of it off of um, the actual game um, with my dice. Do I have my dice here? I do. With my beautiful vampire dice, which I missed using because I couldn't because I had a herniated disc. But I have my beautiful vampire dice that I love so dearly. Um, I just wasn't sure. I'm just not sure of my stats because I have to check. I forget. I don't have a sheet in front of me. <laughs> I should just make myself a sheet of my, my progress. No sooner has Gabriel left that you see Michaela show up outside your store. She rides in fast, wheels screeching to a halt, and jumps off her bike. Throwing open the door, she runs to your counter. Are you okay? He was just here. He was in your store, and he did he do anything to you? Did, did he hurt you? She speaks in rapid bursts, barely taking breaths to barely taking breaks to breathe. Breathe, Michaela. Breathe. Everything is fine. Just take a minute. I'm fine, thank you. She interrupts, sucking in air and swallowing it. 
After several moments of concentrating on her breath, she regains her focus. That person who was just in here is not who you think he is. I mean, he's not a normal person. You're not making sense. Seriously, why don't you sit down and compose yourself and then, Vampires live here, she shouts. You blink hard as you stare at her. You can tell she believes what she's saying. Um, because I have a background in, I wouldn't say that though. I, I have I have a background in supernatural studies, paranormal studies, and paranormal scholar is my occupation. So I wouldn't say he might be something supernatural, but he's not a vampire because that sounds he might be. If I believe in the paranormal, I would say it's hard for me not to believe in in vampires. So I'm gonna say, okay, slow down, take a moment, and think through what you have to say. Yeah, so she just knows. I don't know how she knows, but I want to know. So maybe I'll say, how do you know there are vampires in town? What pr it's the weird thing to say. What proof do you have? I would say something like, what makes you think that? Um, but that's sort of what I want to ask her anyway. It's just weirdly phrased. Inquisitive. <laughs> I have lots of proof, but every time I take a picture or a video, it disappears. Oh no, is Amanda La Sombra? <laughs> I've been watching Mr. Jayfield and Miss Chastain for a long time, and I've seen it with my own eyes. She goes into people's homes at night and drinks their blood. Right, I think she drank my blood. <laughs> I think she drank my blood. So why are you telling me this? Of all the people in town, why tell me? Or, or do others know? She scoffs and pushes back from the counter. I've tried to tell people, but no one believes me. Only one person believes, believed me, or at least tried to believe me, but he's gone now and you're here. It has to be you. Mr. Lucas had to go so you could come here and help me do what needs to be done. And what's that? You have to help me kill the vampires. You have to help me kill Miss Chastain. <laughs> oh, my character's a hard skeptic and I felt bad shutting her down. Right. If I had picked a different, just because I, I really like the idea of the background that our grandfather sort of instilled this idea of like mysticism in us or occultism in us. So I sort of like leaned into that, into the idea of like, we're, we studied science in school, but we're trying to, you know, use science to prove the existence of the, uh, an otherworldly thing. So I really just love that idea, which is why I picked it. Um, so I think she would be, this Huddy would be pretty open-minded about the idea of anything paranormal existing. I, I don't think she would be like, oh my God, let's get stakes and go murder some random woman. But I think we would be curious. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to tell her that's a very serious thing that you're asking me to do. Michaela's expression becomes more intense, her eyes drawing inward, her lips curling. Yes, it's serious. Haven't you been listening? Do you know what vampires do? They drink people's blood and then they kill them. How much more serious does something need to be to get someone to help you around here? Are you sure I'm the best person to help you? I haven't known you for very long. Maybe talk to your mom? She shakes her head and looks off to the side of the store. I've tried, but they all say I'm crazy or I watch too many horror movies. When I tell my mom, she just gets mad at me. No one listens, and that's what the vampires want. She wants people to stay in the dark because that's where she works best. I think she's a La Sombra. Michaela pulls back from the counter and places in front of it, paces in front of it. Can I help you with something else? Maybe we can go talk to your mom together. I know they took Tyler. He's not missing. He's gone. Michaela crouches and hugs her body. You walk from around the counter and approach her. Um, what do you mean they took Tyler? How do you know that? I knew Tyler. He tutored me in math for a few months. He's a really good guy. Yeah, like, I, like I've been saying every part that I played this uh, vampire monster, it's um, that that's exactly what I think we are. Um, as a, uh, there are hedge, hedge mages, hedge wizards. I can't remember sorcerers. It, it depends on which setting 
you're using and vampire settings don't really talk about like mages and stuff um but yes in general there's just a there's generally a group of humans that are just more um sensitive to the to preternatural paranormal goings on like for example for example um back in i think it was 20th anniversary edition when the when gehenna was happening and the red star of gehenna appeared in the sky and like um you know the the sixth great maelstrom happened in um the underworld and um like the antediluvians or the methuselahs started rising up the ravnos antediluvian rose up from the ground supposedly and you know turned all of his childer into basically cannibalistic monsters for a week and um i think the I think what happened with the mages i think the mages cr- like created big bombs all of the worlds of darkness all of the settings something bad happened in addition to like werewolves and changelings and mages all feeling the effect of this red star of gehenna um all people who were uh supernaturally inclined or supernaturally sensitive felt it too it's written in um i think it's written in the 20th anniversary edition or beckett's jihad diary um so they're acknowledged in the world of darkness that there are people who are just like this which i love that's why i love the world of darkness i knew tyler he tutored me in math for a few months he's a really good guy volunteer my cat scratching my chair stop it volunteers at church and he's on the wrestling team she says he's not the type of guy to go missing but tyler was on the podcast last week what was he doing on the podcast she stands and paces again. He's some kind of progeny. He plays the violin like nobody's business. You mean prodigy? Like musical prodigy? She snaps her fingers. Yeah, that's it. He was playing the violin on that stupid podcast, and Miss Chesney was all into it. It was creepy, and now he's missing. I know she took him. If you really think she took him, then we need to tell somebody. Like your mother. She turns and yells, No, don't get my mom involved. She takes a deep breath and blows it out hard. She puts on a smile and fixes her t-shirt. You're right. I'm upset about Tyler. I just, I need to blame someone, but it's wrong. I should go now and get home. I have to wash Carl off my dog and do some soccer drills. It was good seeing you again. Bye, Michaela. With that, she walks out of your store and climbs on her bike. She glances back at you and the worry returns to her face as she rides away. Ooh. I think definitely at this point, we would, um... Gan is so mad at me. I don't know why. He's sick of me talking. <laughs> so if you hear him um, complaining in the background, that's my cat. Um, <laughs> so I definitely think that at this point, this huddy, this huddy, not me, huddy, um, would be like, okay, something is definitely going on in this town. Something supernatural. I, I don't not believe her, but I don't know if it's vampires. But now I'm like super going to be super keeping my eyes out for things. That's where I'm at in my head. And I feel really bad for this girl. And I really want to like be there for her. I wonder if you've become fully awake. Well, probably not in the game. I doubt it. Um, especially since we're going to become hunters. So more that um, that idea is going to be like people who like hunters with true faith are also people who are like sensitive to the supernatural. But instead, it's it's really it was really hard to explain especially half awake people like mages like that haven't quite reached their awakening um basically the perception of uh, how mages do their magic is is uh is how they perceive reality right and that's how they change reality um so if a hunter who is what whether it's a religion or just a moral code whether they really put all of their faith into that they can actually project that outwards towards um vampires or werewolves or whatever really they can actually project that outwards and hurt them or stop their powers from working in the case of vampires um and 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 you can become fully awake like i said not in this game probably not um but in the setting of the world lore wise uh, anyone can, can become fully awake at any time like you could be a, an old man and become fully awake awaken seems that the occult paths open up more storylines and dialogue options and being a skeptic interesting i would assume so especially if you because i know there's options to have true faith in this game so especially if you are open to the idea of these creatures existing of 
believing that things really do go bump in the night, so to speak, then I believe that would definitely open up true faith for you, which is something I would definitely like to. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to go like full on hunter. I, it's probably easier to go full on hunter mode if you um, are more skeptical and more combat focused. I don't know. I really don't. My person's more of a thinker than a fighter. So we'll see what happens. Your first two days in Jericho Heights have not been what you expected. A missing teen, your house broken into, this is not the town you once knew. And now you're dealing with a child who believes in vampires. I want to help her. Like, I want to, like, give her a hug. You glance around the store, which has been empty of customers for a while now. Since you've only been in the Heights for two days, you really want to check out the town and catch up with new and old friends. Closing the shop for a while won't matter much, so you step outside, lock the door, and start on your way to your first stop to see Adam. Oh... Let's go see our maybe baby boyfriend. <laughs> uh, I really do like Adam. I think he's a great character. I like Salem as well, but she got weird about Adam. So I, I kind of want to talk to her about it, but I couldn't sit with her at dinner. Adam's office is only a short walk away down Road Tree. Oh, that Red Tree Road. Sorry. <laughs> Blew my brain out for a second. And sits on a quiet street surrounded by residential homes and a row of elm trees. The front of the store has one long window with black letters spelling out Bain and Sons Accounting. On the other side of the window sit several workers, Adam, his brother Seth, and their mother Anna. Each one is working with the client and only Adam acknowledges you as you step inside. You cross the short room to a wooden bench in a narrow waiting area close to his desk. Mr. McRae, the IRS has no reason to call your phone. I can say with 100% certainty, no one from the FBI is coming to arrest you for unpaid taxes. <laughs> those are like those uh, scams that you see uh, online or get in real life, I guess. Keep in mind, you are mostly retired from your plumbing business and only earn a small amount from ad hoc work. Your income is not on the IRS's radar. Adam speaks in a deeper voice than you're used to, presenting a tone of authority and confidence. Um, so another fun fact about me, one of my, f one things I do when, um, usually when I'm working on lore videos or like I'm, I just need something in the background, I, I listen to a lot of like um, tech support scam videos of people like um, sort of blowing the whistle on tech support scams and getting the, and, and stopping the scammers at least temporarily from doing things. And it's so sad. It makes me so sad because most of their targeted people are the elderly. And um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that really makes me irritated because I have so many people in my life whose parents are elderly and stuff, and they really don't know how anything works. They, they don't know how to, their computer works. And it makes me angry that people take advantage of it. But at least this person actually called their bank instead of just giving over their information. Mr. McRae licks his lips and leans over the front of the desk. So far, his long, straight gray beard touches the surface. His gray hair looks white under the iridescent lights. I hear what you're saying, but the fella told me he knew all my bank account figures and was sending my file over to the FBI in Chicago unless I settled up over the phone. Trust me, you have nothing to worry about. If anyone from the IRS or the FBI or any other agency contacts you, feel free to give them my number. Don't say a word to these people otherwise and don't pay them a cent. Mr. McRae smacks his lips and ends with a frown. With a frown. Is your father around? Maybe I should ask him. He stands and looks down over Adam, clearly eyeing his wheelchair. Sitting there listening, you suppress the urge to interject. Ooh, I'd want to interject. My father is in a meeting across town. Adam says, his tone betraying a sense of annoyance. He will tell you the same thing I'm telling you. Mr. McRae folds his arms over his chest. Now don't get all pissy with me, boy. I don't appreciate the tone of your voice. Adam's mother leans back in her chair and looks over, a look of concern on her face. Adam stammers, his cheeks turn blotchy and red. I I'm sorry, but I just want you to understand. Someone in your condition shouldn't be getting all riled up. Tell your dad I'll give him a ring later. Ooh. As Mr. McRae turns to leave, you... Ooh. We have really good manipulation and persuasion. Is our manipulation or charisma better? Same. They're the same. We're the best. <laughs> A 
Okay. We say, excuse me, sir, you don't know me, but I can tell you Adam is an exceptional accountant and everything he's telling you is accurate. Meh. So you think the IRS and FBI are after a semi-retired plumber in this insignificant town? <laughs> um... I don't really like any of the options. But we can try and convince him that the phone was a scam. Uh, I think I'm going to be a little salty with him. So you think the IRS and the FBI are after a semi-retired plumber in this insignificant town? Sarcastic plus seven. Mr. McRae stutters on his way out. What was that? You shift forward in your seat. You think the government agencies are putting effort into calling someone without a steady income in a remote suburb of Chicago? Maybe they should order a SWAT team to surround your home. Or maybe you'll show up on that live PD show. Mr. McRae twists his lips. Why don't you mind your business, smartass? He says and turns to Adam. Maybe you shouldn't let your friends talk to your valued customers like that. In my business, I treat people who hire me with respect. Relationship with the McCrays, minus eight. Anna Bain, Adam's mother, walks up to Mr. McCray. Chuck, this is just a misunderstanding. Why don't we go to the office and talk about it? Why are you trying so hard to hold on to this business of this person who clearly, sorry, doesn't bring in a lot of income to your business or anything like that? And obviously he's a moron. <laughs> I'm sorry. I used to work. I used to work in customer service. I worked in customer service for years and years, and I haven't worked there in so long. I've forgotten how terrible it is. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have done that. Oh, I lost relationship with Adam as well. I knew I shouldn't have been so salty. I just ugh, irritating. He waves his hand dismissively and opens the front door of the office. Now, nah, just have your husband get back to me. I'm done here today. When he leaves, Anna turns back to you. I am sure that you're trying to help in your own way, but now we have to do damage control. She walks past you and heads into the back office. I hope there is never a next time, but if there is, maybe you should just stay out of it, Adam says, shaking his head. <clears throat> I should have just stayed out of it. <laughs> I had the thought I should, but I, I like to roll the dice. I like to roll the dice. I like to, the clicky Mac rocks that are, aren't here right now. Seth stands from his desk and steps over to Adam. To hell with that guy. He's always been such a bastard. Can't stand him or his sons. Sorry he treated you like that. The two brothers look a lot alike, though Seth is older and thinner and his hair hangs low in a ponytail. They both resemble their father, Daniel, who is always regarded as the Jericho Casanova. At least that's how it was when you were a kid. In the last summers you spend visiting your grandfather, one of Daniel's affairs surfaced, which almost ended his marriage. The marriage continued and so did the affairs. Anna looked the other way and threw her attention harder into the business. Daniel's lies got better and the wheels kept turning. Seth returns to his desk and Adam rolls out from behind his own. Feel like taking a walk? He asks you. I need some air to clear my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> you and Adam stroll down Red Tree Road away from the accounting office and into the shade of elm trees lining the sidewalk. The temperature is almost perfect today, though you notice sweat on Adam's brow. He always ran hot, even as a kid. He once passed out from heat stroke during the stretch of 100 degree weather when you were both 13. As you reach the corner, Adam cuts up the cross street. All these years of me complaining that there's no way for me to get down into the street and nothing ever happens. He pushes his wheelchair another 20 feet to ride down the ramp of the driveway and then backtracks to the crosswalk to stay on Red Tree Road. I, that This RTR just throws me off. At the next corner, the sidewalk is still not sloped, but raised two or three inches. He pops up the front wheels, but struggles to make it onto the curb. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, no, I'm not going to grab him and push him up the curb. I'm going to say, you've got a lot of tricks with that thing. Okay. <laughs> Trying to repair the relationship and not be a dick. Adam laughs. I've had to learn a lot. I try to be as independent as I can. Just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean I have to limit myself to where I go and what I do. Wait until you see me in the snow. I ordered a front-end snow shovel for the winter. He rocks the chair until the two back wheels hop onto the curb. I can't wait to see it. Let me know how much you charge to clear snow from the front of my shop. 
The two of you continue on the sidewalk for another block before turning down Elmwood Street. Oops. A doctor's office, a craft store, and a coffee shop all line the street. Farther down is Ginger's Garden, where dozens of potted plants and colorful flowers sit out in front of the store. Outside of it, a man in a long apron unravels a garden hose and waves at, waves at Adam as he spots him. Hi, Ymir, Adam says, releasing one, one wheel to wave. How's it going, Ymir? T- Ymir turns on the faucet. Water trickles from the end of the hose. Better hurry up, he says with a smile. Something hides in that smile, and when he looks away, his deep-set eyes stare off in the distance. You and Adam pick up the pace to pass the store. Ymir twists the faucet, and water sprays out across the sidewalk and onto the flowers. Once you pass, Adam wheels closer to you and whispers, Poor guy. Ymir came here about ten years ago as a war refugee from South Sudan. Saw all sorts of bad stuff. You glance over your shoulder at Ymir and bump into Adam's wheelchair. That's horrible. Yeah, he's a good guy, though, and, well, if there are any loud noises like fireworks or something, don't make fun of him. I'll do my best, you reply. Adam nods and changes the subject. So have you heard any news about the missing teen? Nothing since last night. Adam shakes his head. There's something going on in this town. I'm getting super worried. What are you worried about? You and Adam turn down an alley back toward the accounting office. Just forget I said anything. I hope they find Tyler. Finish your thought. You can't just leave me hanging like that. Adam takes a deep breath. I just think that a lot of events in the city are all tied together. First, Monroe Duncan goes missing, and now Tyler. There have always been other happenings in Jericho that you just don't know about since you've been away. Um, yeah, good. I'd like to talk about the Shadow Monster. I've witnessed a few strange things since I've gotten back to Jericho Heights. Oh, really? What have you heard? Adam asks. Why don't you talk first? The two of you take the last turn back down Red Tree Road, and you once again see the sign for Bain and Sons Accounting. Adam swallows hard and hesitates before speaking. I know this sounds crazy, but a few weeks ago I saw something I can't explain. (laughs) You mean the monster? The the shadow stuff? The stuff obviously coming from a La Sombra? See, after my accident, my dad converted our den to a bedroom for me. So on this particular night, my parents were out of town and Seth was spending a few nights at our house while he was getting his roof repaired. I heard footsteps upstairs, but I knew Seth was asleep. He always gets up super early and falls asleep by 10, but I'm a night owl. Someone else was upstairs. You and Adam stop outside of the office. Through the glass window, his mother beckons him in. You can't go in until you finish your story. I hate cliffhangers. He holds up his hand to his mother, indicating one minute. When he turns back to you, his left eye twitches and his, he's breathing faster. So Seth was upstairs asleep and someone else was walking around. They were light steps too and I seemed to glide across the floor. It's an old house with lots of weak floorboards and I barely heard a creak. I must have sat at the bottom of the stairs for an hour, listening, waiting, afraid. I still remember my heart beating. I was covered in sweat. I didn't know who was up there, but for some reason, I was terrified. Yeah, so Michaela says that she, the Amanda Chastain feeds on people who are asleep. We had an incident where we were like, oh, this is weird. I feel like I remember someone coming into my room while I was sleeping. So I think we were fed on as well. And now Adam says he believes that Amanda or someone snuck into his house when he was at night and probably fed off of his brother. So what happened? Could you see anything from the bottom of the stairs? Did you hear anything else? He lowers his head, takes in a deep breath, and lets lets it out slowly. I did see someone. At the top of the stairs. We have a spare room that is barely ever open. Mom wanted to make it into a sewing room, but it just became a big storage closet. For some reason, the door was open, and on the back of it is a full-length mirror. Maybe the wind blew it open? I don't know. But I saw a reflection. It was after midnight and completely dark, but in the moonlight I could see a figure stepping across the hall. I think it was a woman in a long dress. Just when I caught a glimpse of her, she moved away in a blur. It 
was the damnedest thing, and for days I replayed that moment in my mind, questioning whether it was a figment of my imagination or if it was real. I mean, still, still could be La Sombra. Can't really see reflections of La Sombra. <coughs> I'm still guessing La Sombra. Either way, that sounds really creepy. Did you ever talk to your brother about what happened? Adam turns his chair towards the store, but waits to enter. He was sick the next day. Pale, tired, cold. We took him to see Dr. Lobo, and she diagnosed him with acute anemia. She told him to eat steak for a few days in a row and come back for a follow-up. But it just doesn't make sense. It's not like he was injured or even had a nosebleed. But he was just drained. So what was it? Or who was it? Look, I don't know, he says, his voice shaking. I gotta go. Thanks for stopping by. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for the walk. Adam heads into the office, and you turn and walk away, still thinking of the story he just told you and the woman in the red dress. As you reflect on the past few days in Jericho Heights, you feel... Excited? <laughs> Not really. Um... Unsettled and concerned. I'm worried about my friends and the people of Jericho Heights. Yep. The vision of Jericho Heights from your childhood is slowly shattering. Tyler Sanders went missing last night, and now you hear about Adam's brother. You're worried about someone breaking into your home last night, and you can't stop thinking about Adam and Salem and people you've just met like Michaela and all the people at the dinner party. Someone is preying on the people of Jericho Heights. Sounds like Annabelle pre-Valley Coterie, exactly. Exactly. It's and which is funny because it, this this uh, Amanda Chastade person is not doing a very good job of keeping the masquerade. I mean, I understand she's likely since she's living in such a small town. She's living outside of Chicago, which in V five is mostly Camarilla. Um, she's likely like Autarchus or Loose Anarch or something, and um, she's not doing a very good job of keeping the masquerade. There's just way too many people in this town who are suspicious. You make your way back home to check on the store, feed Hex, and get a bite to eat. Waiting for you outside is a young man in a brown suit. Sorry, I closed the shop for a few minutes, you say, unlocking the door. Is there something I can help you with? He holds out his hand to you. I am Lam Fun. You may have received a text from me earlier. Technically, I work for your store. You open the door and walk in. Lam following close behind. <sighs> Makes me think of Mr. Lamb from, um, I know Lamb is his first name, but it makes me think of Mr. Lamb from L.A. by Night. You stop at the corner and turn to him. Okay, now what's this all about? Well, we know. We got the letter from him. Oh, Lamb isn't even his first name, is it? Before you can speak, Lamb hands you a resume, though it is off-center and somewhat grainy. I apologize for how this looks. The laser printer at the library was out of ink, so I had to use... A dot matrix printer. You give it a glance and see his full name is Kwong Tu Lam Fan. Good lord. And he has worked at three jobs previously. This very store for six days as a beverage specialist at Morning Pulse Coffee Shop and as a sales coordinator at Double Twenties Hobby Shop. So you go by Lam, you ask? He blinks hard a few times. Yes, I prefer it. My... F Oops. Go away. My full name is long and difficult for Americans to say. I now go by, by my middle name, since it's easy to pronounce. If that's what you prefer, you say. He straightens his stance like he's, like he's at attention in military line. So when would you like me to start? Is he a hunter? Is that why he's so like weird? Whoa, slow down. Let me ask you a few questions first. Okay, fine. Just so you know, I am the hardest worker you will ever hire. I greatly enjoyed working for your grandfather and know the store very well. I am never late and only need minimal breaks. Are you a robot, you ask? Lamb cracks a smile. I wish. Sadly, I am not. If there were ever any option to transfer my consciousness into an android, I would do it. No questions asked. Okay, mage. Anyway, please ask me anything you'd like. Okay, so he's a member of the technocratic union. That's why he acts so weird. <laughs> Kidding. I think he's probably a hunter, though. You say... Ooh, I don't think I have any leadership, do I? One composure, 
No leadership. All right. Forget that. <laughs> I just like to roll the dice. It's fun. Um, do you know a girl named Michaela? She used to work here. Lamb nods. Yes, but I only worked with her twice. She wasn't really an employee of the store, so much as someone who sat behind the counter and kept her grandfather company. Yeah, Kevin Jackson would not like uh, Amanda Chastain. That's just probably why she's not in Chicago. <laughs> I didn't know her position or title and asked, for an organ and asked for an organizational chart. That request was denied. We didn't interact much, and that's fine by me. I'm not too fond of children in general. Lamb scans the store, his expression not giving away his thoughts. You need a lot more customers in here. Did you market the store before your grand opening? I did market the store and had a huge opening this morning. Lamb looks around the store again. You will need to develop a marketing plan to sustain the customer flow. He takes out a notepad from his jacket pocket and jots something down. He writes for a moment then looks up at you, waiting for your next question. Uh... How was it working for my grandfather? Lamb considers the question before answering. I very much enjoyed working for him. I found it very educational, and he gave me the freedom to sell to customers without the micromanagement I have seen at other jobs. To be fair, working for him was not without challenges. I found him to be quite secretive and prone to anger, not that it was directed towards me. Sometimes his face would turn so red and his voice would get so low and scratchy, I thought he was a demon. Otherwise, I enjoyed it very much. You really nailed it. Described him perfectly. The front door rattles from the wind and the chimes jingle as though a customer were entering. I'm enjoying this interview more than the one I had with your grandfather. Lamb adjusts a display stand on the counter. You say? Why did you leave your other jobs? I think I'm definitely going to hire him. Just because I want to. Just because he's like weird and I kind of want to hire him. Hey, fairy blood! Happy birthday! <laughs> I wish you a happy birthday in the very beginning of the stream. Because <laughs> I know a lot of people weren't going to be able to join because it's such an early stream. Lamb puts on a scowl. Differences of opinion. Would you mind elaborating? Normally, yes, I would mind. But under these circumstances, I must answer your questions. I worked at Double Twenties, a hobby shop, for almost six months. I was by far the top salesman. Even the owner could not compare with my sales numbers each month. I made suggestions around the holiday season to change the layout of the store to be more efficient. The owner rejected the idea and went so far as to ridicule it. It was then that I realized he lacked the leadership skills that were necessary for me to thrive. And what about the morning pulse? What happened there? Lamb scoffs and folds his arms over his chest. The owners left me in charge quite often to take long breaks and extended lunches. One day I showed exceptional initiative and altered the ordering system to maximize maximize profits and lessen the time it took for my customers to order. When the two owners returned, they had the audacity to reverse all of my changes and send me home for the day. I took great offense at this and never returned. Try ordering a large double latte while you're in a rush. Good luck. The store door opens and in walks an older woman with a cane in one hand and a small shaggy dog under her arm. She walks straight toward the counter and places the dog on the surface. He wags his tail and lies down like he's been there a million times. The dog's comfort and the way the woman moves through the store suggests she has been there a number of times. Before you can open your mouth, Lamb steps up to her. Mrs. Jenkins, it's a pleasure to see you. How can we help you today? She smiles at him, hands him her cane, and takes out her purse. Oh, Lamb, I left the house and didn't even remember to bring my doggy bags. And Baxter had his afternoon ritual right outside the store. Do you have any for sale? Lamb leans over the counter, reaches under it, and grabs a small plastic bag. Will this do? She smiles with an all-too-happy giggle. Thank you so much. That's perfect. As she reaches for it, Lamb holds on. Why don't I go outside and clean it up? Maybe you will see something you like in here. He makes his way towards the door, leaving you with Mrs. Jenkins. What a wonderful young man. She stares around the room and her eyes go wide. Oh dear, I love that. Can I see it? She points to a Kindle paperwhite. My grandson has one of those. Would you be so kind and show that to me? You step... <laughs> Ask me about my grandchildren. <laughs> Weird is fun. Yep. Oh, you're in Southern California? Yeah, it's really early in the morning for you now. 
for see for me it's 11 in the morning so i'm fine <laughs> yeah it's weird that he wants to go pick up her dog's duty but you know whatever you step from behind the counter and fetch it placing it on the counter you slide in front of her and she gives it a quick look over baxter looks up at you and wags his tail i want it she says will you deliver it to my home i can pay by check if you accept it or cash on delivery cash on delivery is fine does there any place that does cod anymore i remember when i was a kid like <laughs> in the 90s when i was a kid um there was <laughs> so many advertisements on tv would say no cash on delivery because apparently that stopped being reliable <laughs> shocking <laughs> Maybe food, maybe food delivery still do cash on delivery. Y'all in America will have to tell me because I do not order food any in here in Germany because I don't like any of the restaurants here that deliver. I like some of the restaurants that don't deliver, but I don't like any of the restaurants that do deliver. At least not in my city. Um, you quickly ring her up. As you finish, Lamb returns to the store and tosses a poop-filled bag into the trash. Thank you both, Mrs. Jenkins says. You two have been so wonderful. Say goodbye, Baxter. The tiny dog barks once, making more of a squeak. She picks him up and leaves the store, thanking you both again on the way out. Lamb grabs a towel from behind the counter and wipes it down where the dog was laying. Don't worry, I will take out the trash before I go and can deliver her package. Should we continue my interview? <laughs> do they still do cash on delivery? That's crazy. Um, what do you like about Jericho Heights? I don't know why that's relevant. Honestly, Lamb rubs his chin and clicks his teeth before answering. The opportunity. My family came here with few expectations. Since then, my father has started a law practice and my mother now runs a marketing company. We did not expect such a small town to accept us so openly. Not all places welcome Asians or people who look like they do not come from America. Of course, we have had obstacles, and some people have shown prejudices, but we never felt like we lacked opportunity. Okay, what do you like least about Jericho Heights? How is that relevant? I've never been to a job interview where they asked me what I liked and disliked about the city. <laughs> it's a small town, and there is only one of anything, he says, and then pauses like he expects you to understand him completely from those few words. When you don't respond, he continues. One Vietnamese restaurant. One hobby store with tabletop role-playing games. One bus route. At some point, I may have to move to a larger city with more options, but for now, I enjoy other aspects of Jericho Heights. Okay. I'm definitely gonna gonna hire this dude. Because he's weird, and I kind of dig it. I, I kind of dig the weird, the weird, the weird vibes I'm getting from him. I'm kind of kind of dig it. I'm kind of all about that. So let's hire him. Lamb's face lights up with a beaming smile. Right now, I will just take out the trash and clean the store until the customers show up. While I work, I will consider potential marketing initiatives. You will not be disappointed in my performance. I'm sure of it. You'll make a great addition to the staff here, which is currently just me. Still smiling, Lamb heads off to begin cleaning the shop. And that sort of gives me more time to do stuff. Besides, um, just running the store. You leave Lamb to watch the store and head across town to the middle school to return Lacey's iPhone to her. Oh, that's right. Forgot about her. Not wanting to move the red beast from its nice parking spot, you take a bus that lets you out right at the main entrance. It's a little into the afternoon when you arrive. You don't remember the schedule, but school should be letting out soon. Unsure how to find Lacey, you ask a teacher for help. They inform you that Lacey called out sick today. Oh, yeah. Since you don't know her address, you spend a few minutes getting to know the teacher and gaining their confidence. It only takes a warm smile and a few white lies, and 20 minutes later, they indicate where Lacey lives. That's dangerous. As you walk towards her house, you enjoy the quiet town in the late afternoon. About a quarter mile from her house, you take a turn onto Longview Road, only to be greeted by the sound of screeching tires, crashing metal, and breaking glass. You whip around in the direction of the noise and spot an out-of-control car half on the sidewalk across the street, plowing through the outdoor tables of a diner. People are screaming and running to get out of its way. The driver leans half out of his window, yelling and swearing at anyone in his path. Oh my god, it's Duke Bowie! He's gone crazy! 
You hear the voice of a random bystander shouting from across the street. Someone might be hurt. You bolt down Juniper Lane, weaving around the cars, trying to figure out what has happened. Good question. Good question. <laughs> from your new vantage point, you spot the black Ford Mustang barrel through a sidewalk sign for right aid and slam into a tree head on. The front of the car bends into a U and the driver hits the windshield head first. Now that the car has stopped, you and several other bystanders move closer. What is happening? Workers in a nail salon stare through a window at the scene while billowing white smoke <clears throat> from the engine gives their faces an otherworldly cast. Smartphones are already in people's hands, some calling 911, others filming the aftermath of the wreck. A few victims of the motorized mayhem are splayed across the sidewalk. It's a mix of chaos and amazement because in this small town, nothing like this ever happens. Such an event marks a place in history in the minds of all those present and those who would hear about it or read about it in days and months and years to come. A fog covers your eyes, a cloud of pure white. You blink to clear your sight and your vision and a vision fills your mind. A man emerges from the car wreckage, a behemoth wearing a mask of blood who rushes into a crowd and attacks everyone in reach. What is happening? The edges of your vision ripple like you set fire to a Polaroid. Several outcomes unfold almost in unison, flickering and stuttering and like silent movies. In the first, you shout at Duke, who chases after you for a short distance until you collide with someone in the crowd. Another, See, if we have like these visions and things like that, I, I really find it hard to believe that we wouldn't be open to the idea of vampires. Another image takes over, one of you tackling him from behind. You wrap your arms around his chest, and he swings you around and throws you off. You slam into the side of his car, back arching in pain. Ugh. The images fade as quickly as they came, and you stare at the smoking Mustang, the broken glass, and the bent metal in the, in the street. Duke stirs in the driver's seat. When he sits up, his forehead is covered in blood, which trickles down his face and into his thick brown beard. His door rattles and flies open. One of his massive legs steps out onto the street, and the crowd gasps and backs away a few steps. I'll kill every last one of you fucking cockroaches! He yells in a gruff voice like he swallowed nails. Jesus. A man steps out of a Buick behind the wreck and steps forward, hands raised in a sign of peace. Duke, what the hell are you doing, man? Duke steps from the car and stands. Dressed in a plaid shirt and camouflage cargo pants, he stands six and a half feet tall and has the body of a pro wrestler. Great. He growls, grabs the man who stepped from the Buick, hoists him in the air, and tosses him like a laundry bag. The man flips feet overhead and smacks in onto his windshield, which spider webs from the impact. Screams erupt from the crowd, and those watching scatter in all directions. Some run towards the stores, others back to their cars, and a few fall to the ground amid the mayhem. Any that get too close to Duke are punched or kicked. He screams and chases down anyone in his sight until someone else catches his eye and becomes his target. What the hell is happening? I hate people who just stand there and film stuff, I know. <laughs> if this was happening, I'd be running. A small shaggy dog starts out from the entrance of the diner and rushes over to him, barking and prancing at his feet. It's Baxter, Mrs. Jenkins' dog, and you see her standing on the sidelines calling his name, her face turning to terror when Duke stares down at the tiny dog. Oh my god, I have to save the dog. A momentary sparkle of light catches your eye. In the shadow of an alley between two buildings stands a figure with a smartphone in a cage-like video rig, aimed at the rampaging Duke. You can't make out any details of the stranger. In the pandemonium, you're hit from behind because you are off balance already. You slam into the wall of a laundromat. Though you're not hurt, you find yourself shaken by the impact. You take several deep breaths to calm yourself. Looking around, you resolve to... Dear God. Ooh! We could place a curse. Okay. We can calm, try and calm the crowd. Get him away. I always want to save the dog. <laughs> Um, search Duke's car while he's away from it. Maybe I can find out what set him off. Get Duke's attention and distract him. Ugh. 
I don't have enough decks and athletics to save the dog. That's the problem. But <laughs> resolve and occult, that's a seven dice pool. That's a seven dice pool. I can place a curse on Duke to disrupt his rampage. I really want to save the dog, but I can't. And I don't have any strength in combat to literally try and restrain him. What am I, the Hulk? I'm going to place a curse on him because it's literally my best option here. What's Well, what's what's my investigation? Is it more than seven? Uh, intelligence. Two. Investigation. Whoa, why am I not seeing it? That's five. That's still a good dice pool. That's still a great dice pool. Intelligence investigation. But seven dice pool is even better. Let's place a curse on him. Let's do it. Let's curse him. Ooh, I put a spell on you. You place a curse on a mortal or a vampire. Dang. I'm a lost of willpower and health. Holy shit. Some call them hexes. While you've always thought of them as curses. In your studies of the occult, you learn to focus your energy to change one's fate. Could be as simple as a misstep or a minor malady to something catastrophic. Placing a curse is not without its cost. Summoning these energies takes its toll on you physically and mentally. You're committed now, so you concentrate and summon your will to focus the energies. If you don't stop Duke, he'll only hurt more people. You can't let that happen. Breathing in and out in a brisk pattern, you feel a buildup of malignant power like you're charging a battery past its peak. As Duke bull rushes a car full of people, you extend your hands and form your fingers into a symbol. The energy discharges in a rush, and though nothing material shows, you feel the curse flow from your hands to the target. You wobble and reach out to the wall to keep your balance. Your head swims for a few seconds, and you feel a bit of pain in your stomach that passes quickly. You hate to use such negative energy, but you feel you had no choice. Minus two health, minus one willpower. Dang. I hope, I hope I saved the dog. Duke stops before reaching the car and screams. The driver struggles to put the car in reverse as the back tires spin with a sudden screech and a billow of smoke. Duke rushes to the driver's window but slips on the street. His legs fly up and he slams flat on his back. The car pulls out fishtails and drives in the opposite direction. Moving closer, you spot an oil slick beneath, beneath Duke, and as he tries to stand, he slips further, which only seems to enrage him more. Yeah, I feel super cool cast. I mean, it probably doesn't feel great since I, um, doop de doop where's my, oh, where's my thing? There it is. <laughs> Blind. Since I have now two health and two willpower. Uh, I, uh, I probably don't feel super great. Nothing on the shelves. Oh, I need to worry about my store, but not right now. Sirens blare in the distance, and you see the first signs of flashing lights at the end of the street. Smoke comes out of the hood of, the jeep, of a jeep, and its driver stumbles out with a bleeding cut across his head. A few feet away, a woman lies on the ground unconscious. The body of Mrs. J no! The body of Mrs. Jenkins' dog lies on the edge of the curb, its back bent and broken. Duke pounds his chest, takes a few steps forward, and staggers for another few. He shakes his head and stumbles until he catches himself against a tree. No, the dog! No, I'm so upset. I'm so upset right now. Damn it. If I had, if I had picked more Dex Athletics-y stuff, I maybe could have saved the dog. <clears throat> <sighs> a police cruiser and a sheriff's car speed around the corner and make their way through the traffic. Most of the crowd has dispersed, though many stand and watch from inside shops. Some stay nearby to film the action on their phones. Ooh, look at the dead dog. I'm so mad at myself. The ambulance pulls up and Duke rushes at it with a renewed sense of purpose. My curse was crap, apparently. The EMTs start to get out but pause. They see him coming and close and lock the doors, remaining inside as Duke crashes against the hood. His thick arms grip each side of the vehicle, and for a moment you think he's going to pick up the whole thing. Instead, he rattles the ambulance from side to side, <laughs> slamming the EMTs from side to side. The sheriff's car is the first to pull up. Yes, Deputy Sheriff April Maya, who we love, who you last saw at the mayor's dinner party, gets out with her taser in hand. Duke, what the hell are you doing? She shouts as she moves towards him. 
When he doesn't turn, she yells even louder. This isn't like you. You're a good man. Please turn around. Talk to me. He releases the ambulance and spins to face her, his chest heaving and, a, and face a deep demonic red. As he turns from the vehicle, he slams his knee on the front bumper and hops to the side with his legs straightened. He howls in pain but quickly ignores it and half runs towards the deputy sheriff. Whoa, whoa, stop! She shouts and holds, her arms, holds out her arms with the taser. Duke, no! She fires the taser which latches onto his right thigh. His legs go rigid but he rips out the nodes and tosses them to the ground. Without stopping, he stampedes into her. She lifts her arm and curls her body to absorb the impact, which knocks her back like a pinball and slams her into the Mustang. God damn it. The state trooper's car pulls up and spins to a halt just next to Duke. Two troopers pop out of the car, the closest one to Duke with a baton in his hand. Manipulation, intimidation did the job for me. Doe dogs were harmed. I didn't have a manipulation, intimidation one. As far as I know, I had uh, the best one that I had was intelligence investigation. I didn't have a manipulation intimidation one. I don't know what the hell this guy is. I don't know what's going on with him. The other trooper is large, meaty man, close in size to Duke. He lumbers around the front of the squad car and yanks out his sidearm. Get your hands up! Duke lunges at him and grips his throat and arm. They tussle against the side of the cruiser, and the pistol goes flying to the middle of the street. You've never seen anything like this before, not in Chicago and certainly not in Jericho Heights. Something tells you there are unnatural forces at work. No one has the strength and fortitude to fight an entire crowd and battle police officers. Is Michaela right about vampires in the Heights? Is there more at work here than anyone can perceive? Duke slams a forearm into the trooper's head, knocking him clean out. No one stands against him now. You hear no more sirens coming, no cavalry storming in. Seeing the story unfold, you convince Duke to give up. Maybe if I reason with him, he'll end this rampage. That's all I have. I don't have a manipulation one. Uh... And I don't have enough decks in combat to do anything. So I'll try. It's not going to work, but I'll try. Stop the rampage. Maybe Duke isn't too far gone. Whatever is making him enraged must wear off at some point. You rise from the sidelines and walk forward, hands raised to your side to appear as non-threatening as possible. Duke, please listen to me. No one is trying to hurt you except me when I cursed you just a minute ago. <laughs> I just want to talk. He swings his massive body around and glares at you. He takes a few measured steps forward and breathes in rapid, uneven bursts. You don't know me, but I'm a friend. Why don't you tell me what's wrong? Let's figure it out together. As you talk to Duke and keep him facing you, Deputy Sheriff Maya crawls towards her car and Pop opens the side door. You keep your hands out to your sides and talk in a low, even voice. My name is Huddy. My grandfather Lucas just died, so I moved back to Jericho to take over his shop. I used to visit him during the summer every year when I was a kid. You are friends with Seth Bain, right? I'm friends with his brother Adam. Seth, he says. And in that instance, a change comes over his face. His features soften, his shoulders relax, and he blinks hard like he's clearing away a film from his eyes. He places his hands on his injured knee, and you can tell the pain has taken some of the fight out of him. Yep, Seth Bain. You guys used to rule the high school, I heard. No one could mess with you two. I heard stories of how you used to tear up the football field. Seth, Seth's brother Adam was the hell of a football player, too. He must have learned from the best. Hearing your words, tears run down Duke's face, his arms drop, his body slouches, and he slides to the ground. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You should be sorry. You killed a dog. Sorry. <laughs> I really like animals. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on with this guy? Is he possessed? Oh, hey. Hey, Leela. Um, is he possessed or something? That poor dog. I know. I'm so mad at him. I'm like, you killed a dog, so kind of mad at you. I don't know. I don't know what happened. What is with this guy? I wish I knew. It's nuts. Chapter 5. This town ain't right. Although I felt weak, I did not feel ill, and strength, one always fancies, is a thing that may be picked up when we please. 
Joseph Sheridan Le Fenu, Car- Carmia. Oh. I'm very interested. I'm very uh, trying to get over the dog thing. I'll work on it. You sit on a wooden bench outside Dimple's laundromat, watching the tumult of law enforcement, EMS workers, firefighters, news reporters, and onlookers. Pandemonium. You're staring into the heart of chaos. A state trooper walks towards you. He's a sandbag of a man, a solid slab of body with a flat face and bald head. He marches towards your driver's side door with the look of someone who's already worked long hours today. Um, Trooper Stewart, pleased to meet you, though I wish it were under better circumstances. Hello, Trooper. So you're the hero of the day. He opens up a leather-bound notebook and clicks open a ballpoint pen. Deputy Maya told me you talked down Mr. Bowie. You saved a lot of lives here. Everyone's calling you a hero, but I didn't save the dog. Baxter. The most important person in the town. Besides my cat, Hex. (laughs) Hmm... Yeah, uh, that's that's a good point, Paul. Did he get hit by Spark of Rage? Maybe. Spark of Rage is a potence power? No, presence power? It's a it's an amalgam power, but what's it what's it with? I'd have to look it up. It's it's well, you know what? I can look it up right now because I I'm on my computer, ain't I? Um <laughs> I got to find all my stuff where I have everything um Organized, sort of, not really. Let's see. So you can tell I use this book a lot when I do stuff. Um, do do do. Spark of Rage, I believe, is a presence amalgam or a potence amalgam. What 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 is it? Potence amalgam. Yeah, potence amalgam. Yeah, okay, so it's a potence and presence amalgam. So you need level three potence and level three presence. So that's a pretty powerful vampire. When active, da 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 da, inside a person or a crowd, to violence. So maybe, maybe that's what happened. I don't know. For some strange reason, every time when in movies or games people get killed, I'm fine with that. When a do- oh, I'm the same way, Leela. I can. Uh, I usually. I think there's a website. I usually Google if I'm going to watch a movie. I'm like, do animals die in this movie? Because then I don't want to watch it. Like I watched. I remember way back in the 2000s when I Am Legend came out, and I'm like, if something. And you know, I'm sorry if this is spoilers. Close your eyes now. But the the dog doesn't make it, and I just like I've never watched it again. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> I refuse. That guy was lucky it wasn't John Wick's dog, am I right? <laughs> it's so true. Oh, man. Um. So, yeah, I think I'm actually going to stop here because my throat is starting to go. Um, and uh, I want to get some stuff done or and actually take it easy since I had a really rough day yesterday. I want to take it easy because I am, um, like I said, meeting some friends tonight to for the first time in months and months and months, almost a year. I'm very excited about it. Um, but I want to thank you guys so much for being here. I know this was such a super early stream and I wasn't expecting anyone to show up, but you guys were still here. And I missed half of the chat of you guys talking because my phone wasn't updating because it loves me so much. Um, but I will be back um, <laughs> hopefully, Kane willing, I will be back uh, tomorrow night, Monday night, uh, for another stream. Probably won't be back Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm not sure because I have physical therapy for my herniated disc. And although physical therapy helps, usually the the day and the day after, I'm a little bit like I can't do a whole lot. I'm a little bit hurty, and then like the third day, I'm like ready to go. I feel great. So <laughs> I'll have to let you guys know as a pro- I know it's so dumb so many you know my my lovely streamer friends and and world of darkness friends can just like you know have their schedules and do their thing and stream and 
right now with me, it's sort of an up in the air type of a thing if I can do it, if I can't. So I just want to thank you guys for like sticking with me and giving me encouragement and stuff. You guys really are the absolute best. And um, I hope I can keep bringing you more of this game because I'm dying to finish it. I'm dying to get into the meat of it. So um, yeah, thank you guys so much. And I hope you have an awesome day. And again, Fairy Bloods, have a great birthday. Thanks, guys.